that tells me at least it tells me she thought she wasn't hurt that bad. But it, I gave her a good uh, urging to go to the clinic. Because with an injury to the knee, you just don't know. You know what I mean? You just too much in there that can be messed up. Well, it, it. Am I on? Oh, there I'm on. Okay. The lights aren't on me, but that's okay. I'm okay with that. Whoa. Spoke too soon. <laughs> Good morning. What a beautiful morning we have, too, out there. Um, I just want to announce something that's in our bulletin real quick, and that is, I didn't notice it before, but if you have a cell phone, could you put it on silent, please? We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, some announcements today. First, I'd like to thank all of you that helped in some way yesterday with our Bountiful Hearts. We served over somewhere around 70 meals. That's carry out, delivery, and eat in. So, you know, it, it was good. And, and hearing some of the stories of the people that delivered, um, how appreciative those people they delivered to are. And just... Um, I heard one this morning, and the guy said, I can't believe you're still doing this. I really thank you so much that you continue to do this. So thank you all that, that helped in getting that ready and in and serving people. Um, lots of announcements. You can see some of them up on the screen. There are some in your bulletin. Um, number one announcement I'd like to make real quick is... We will not have Karen with us today. 
as yesterday, um, her ram decided to use her as a battering ram. And they were shearing, and the ram hit her, and hurt her. she is okay, as she says she is. But, but anyway, yes, just wanted to let you know. So we need you to sing real loud, because we don't have our music leader with us today, okay? Um, Charge Conference is on May 11th at 6.30, followed by the SLB. This conference is to vote. Duke Energy is looking at a piece of our property at the back that we really can't use a whole lot, and they need it for access back there. So we're voting on that on May 11th. So if you have any questions, come out that night, because I can't answer any of them, because I don't know a whole lot about it. I just know that they're looking to purchase that property. Uh, please, the cards in front of you in the pockets on the chairs, uh, that's our information and prayer cards. So if you could fill those out, especially if you're visiting with us, we'd love to know, you know, how you came to stop by to, to join us. And if you have any prayer concerns, please write them on there. Your prayer team prays for them, the minister prays, and, and then they get sent out also in an email. Um, speaking of prayer, National Day of Prayer happens May 5th, which is also Cinco de Mayo, but we skip that. Um, at noon to one, it is a Zoom and it will be live, so you can watch it live. Uh, on Facebook, but then you can also watch it later on because then it will be recorded. So if you don't get a chance to watch it, you can watch it um, later on on uh, Facebook and possibly on our church uh, Facebook or website. Um, okay, is there anything else I'm missing? Oh, we do are in need of some people to help out in the nursery. Please, please. So, I mean, Kim goes in there almost every time we have one for in the nursery. And we'd really like to have someone else, you know, take turns going in there. We don't always have someone, for a, a child in the nursery. But when we do, we do need to have a couple people available for that. And also the cafe is in need of help setting out food and things. So um, if you could do help out with that, that would be great, see Trish. And then on May 22nd is the sold out conference. That is not that it is sold out, that is their name, S-O-U-L apostrophe D, out. That's their name. So it's, it's open to the public. Please come out and enjoy that time together, just listening to to this uh, group, they're a gospel, Southern gospel, so come join us. And I think that's it. I think Robin's got something. Do we, do we have the picture or slide? Okay. Hey guys, um, last Sunday, no, last Tuesday, um, some of us went to visit Joyce at her new place, and you guys have been asking how she is. Her son um, t will um, keep in contact with myself and Jennifer. Joyce is doing phenomenal, you know. Um, she was her old self. I don't know if you guys had talked to her lately, but she was very confused, and Tuesday was such a blessing that when we left there, we almost felt like crying because it was the old Joyce, such a beautiful place. Um, her birthday is next week. She's going to be 94 years old, and Jennifer has her mailing address and a phone number. If you guys want to give her a call, she would so appreciate it. Okay. So if you will join me, let me put my glasses back on, in our call to worship, please. And stand, please, if you can. Oh, Lord, our God, we praise you. You have restored our lives. Okay, if you remain standing, we're going to sing How Great Is Our God.
think you may be seated. I'm going to invite the children to come down if they would. Uh, I know we have some children present here today. I know you see them less and less, and I think they're on the verge of being phased out of our culture. Have any of you been to the circus? You been? Have you been to the circus? Okay. Well, it's being, I think it's kind of being phased out, the circus. Circus is a place where all of these uh, performers come together and do amazing stunts. Uh, one of the things they're most famous for is often you'll see one guy, who's not very smart, by the way, uh, in a closed-up cage with about six hungry lions. You know, that's the, and then the other thing you, you'll never forget if you get to see this is the flying trapeze, the flying trapeze. Um, oftentimes, when you're at the circus and you're seeing the flying trapeze folks do their stunts, you're afraid they're going to fall because normally they're way, way up high. I mean, taller than our church is. And thank goodness there's a net down below to catch them if they fall. Well, um, I used to wonder, how could they get up there and do all the stuff they do without being paralyzed by their fear, you know, of, of falling? And at some time later, um, we were able to talk to some flying trapeze artists uh, behind the scenes, and they told us how they be became as good as they were. And they had a little, a little cable about one foot from the ground, and they practiced a lot of their stunts, starting off one foot from the ground, then, then they go a little higher and a little higher, and uh, what, they, what they do is they fail enough that they actually gain confidence in the net below. That once you've fallen a few times, the fear of actually falling kind of goes away because you, you know there's a net down there going to catch you. And so instead of being focused on their fear, they're up there doing all of these stunts, doing uh, flips through the air and uh, walking on high wires and, and all of this stuff. Um, but the thing was, they learned that the net was strong enough. And the result of falling and being caught, of course, let them get confidence. And as they gained their confidence, they would, they would do more and more. And, you know, that's one of the benefits of failure. Uh, that's one of the benefits of failure. Sometimes, the more faith you have, the less you have to worry about worrying. And as Christians, sometimes we fail. And sometimes our prayers don't get answered. Sometimes things don't work. But at other times, you are able to look back and say, things didn't go well as I planned, but God worked it out anyway. And often we find that to be the case uh, in the church. And the Bible tells us that our God is the one with everlasting arms. There's a song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And that's what that means. So when you fall, know that there's a God there who catches you. And that's important in the Christian life because when we fall, we learn about the grace of God that we can depend on it. So don't be afraid to, to, to try great things for God. Don't be afraid to pray for other people's healings. Don't be afraid to pray for miracles uh, for other people or for yourself. You know, people say, well, what if it don't work? Well, what if it does? right? And the Bible says that with God, nothing is impossible. So you can't go wrong trusting in him. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the children in our church today. We ask God that you will uh, grant them to know your love and your presence in their lives through their experience. Pray, Lord, that uh, next time that they are worried, frightened for some reason, afraid of failing, that you would remind them that you are the ones with the ever you are the one 
with the everlasting arms and that there is no, no place we can fall from that you can't reach and catch us. We give you thanks for all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming down and talking with me. And I want to tell the kids, uh, talking to the kids, oh, the kids are leaving. Okay. Well, there was one night this week that I wasn't feeling well. I can handle pain in different places in my body and, and, and manage it. Uh, but there's something about stomach pain that gets to me, at least. Um, I've often had some of the worst pain, I think, in my life in my stomach. A couple of nights ago, I laid down to go to sleep on my couch, and my stomach just started hurting real bad. And uh, it was in pain. There was really nothing I could do about it. I'd already taken meds and laid down. So I just reached down and put my hand over my side and started praying and asked God to take that pain away. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you why God does or doesn't do what he does, but I was praying that God would take that pain away, and he did. So whatever was going on, it was pretty bad pain. I was actually thinking, I don't, if I get one surgery right now, <laughs> I won't be able to get my next surgery <laughs> that, that I need in two weeks. I was worried about my gallbladder, you know. Any of you ever have a gallbladder attack? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. They're, they're not fun things, and uh, I think I have some gallbladder issues. But uh, praise God. I just wanted to share that story, let you know. Um, sometimes the Lord does hear our prayers, even, even when we doubt. Um, you know, and that's what I thought. Well, what if I pray and God doesn't do anything? I'm like, well, he ain't, you know, it ain't like he's busy. He's here with me. <laughs> so I might as well ask him. And so I asked him, and, and he allowed me to feel better and go to sleep. And uh, it's been a few days, and thank the Lord uh, that pain hasn't come back. And I, I'm thankful for that. And over my own personal life, I've seen God uh, answer prayer. And I think we, we can all testify at some point we've seen God answer and hear our prayers. And uh, as to why he doesn't, all we can say is be, we trust him. I know I can trust God from the good, t from the good times that he's, the times he's been good to me, the times he's done things for me, enough to understand when I go through the hard times and it doesn't seem like he's doing something for me, that he, that he is. And uh, oftentimes we don't understand. And of course, uh, the proverb writer writes for us, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your paths. And of course, prayer is the, one of the greatest ways uh, we acknowledge the Lord. So let's go before uh, God together in a time of prayer this morning. God of grace, we're just thankful for how you reveal your love to us, even in the midst of our failure. During those times that we make our largest mistakes, it's often during those times that you show us the greatest goodness. It's often those times when we are in darkness that your light shines the brightest. And even as a human race, God, we made great mistake in sinning against you. But you came to us and your son and, and died for us and died for our sin. And you made known to us the risen Christ. And you made available to us, despite our mistake, your love and your grace. And we thank you for making yourself known to us in the everyday activities of life, such as eating, dinner with friends or with family. We thank you for enabling us to hear the sound of your voice, perhaps 
uh, through study of your word or listening to one of your servants. We thank you, Lord, for making yourself known to us through our senses and making known to us the new life that Christ has come to give to us. We pray, Lord, that you would lead us by your spirit. And even today, we welcome your spirit here amongst us and thank you for his presence with us. And Father, we, we ask that you would help us to uh, turn away from those things that would distract us, those things that would keep us from seeing Jesus, not only in our church or our worship time, but help us, Lord, to uh, turn away from those things that would keep us from seeing Jesus in our everyday lives and often uh, drown out his voice. And forgive us, Lord, for those times that we uh, neglect our time of study of Scripture, our time of uh, setting aside time to be with you. Forgive us when we do not respond to your call uh, to feed your sheep, uh, to tend to your lambs as you have called us, but help us to be faithful. Help us, God, to never forget that we are your beloved children. And that through Christ you say to us, uh, you are my beloved, and you I'm well pleased. We pray, God, today clothe us with the same joy that you clothe your son with, the joy that was his strength through his trials and his temptations. Let us be clothed with that same joy. And we pray, Lord, and ask that you would uh, move on behalf of those who we lift before you in our hearts. We uh, continue to pray to you for the sick. Uh, we ask, God, that you would strengthen uh, those of us who are weak in body or spirit or mind here in this place today. And by faith, Lord, we lift up to, to you those in our lives who, who may be sick this morning. And uh, we, we see you, God, laying your hands upon them. And uh, we see you touching them and imparting to them uh, your healing presence. And we pray for those who are caregivers today, uh, maybe a spouse, maybe uh, someone here who uh, works in a hospital or place of uh, caring. We, we ask God, renew their compassion. So often uh, caregivers give and give and uh, receive sometimes so little in return. But we ask, Lord, that you would uh, just touch them with your presence and pour yourself into their lives so that they can continue uh, to give to others. And we pray for those uh, here who may have been victims of violence or uh, abuse. Um, we pray, God, that you would um, bring healing to hearts and minds and enable, enable those who are brought down by these things to be made free. We pray for families that may be in conflict. We, we pray, God, for peace in our families. And we pray for those in our families who do not know Christ. Uh, we ask God in some way uh, that we may be a light for them. We pray for those who, who uh, may be in prison or incarcerated at this time. Uh, God, we know that good people make mistakes. And uh, Lord, we lift, uh, we lift these people up to you by faith this morning. And we pray, as so often you, you did in Scripture, that you would visit them even uh, in this place of incarceration and make yourself known to them. We pray for those, God, who struggle with drug addiction. Lord, the, uh, the enemy uses uh, this in such a powerful way right now to draw so many of us away, away from you. We pray, Lord, that you, might, um, that you might bring an end to the drug smuggling into our, our nation, our community. And uh, we pray that our family, our friends, those who are bound by um, terrible, rotten thing of addiction, uh, that you would set them free. And we pray for us, God, uh, maybe we're not addicted to a street drug, but we are addicted to other things in our life. 
Uh, we look to you, Lord, and pray uh, that you would free us from those things uh, that ultimately keep us from living in the joy that you have for us. And God, we quiet our hearts before you this morning. We trust that your spirit uh, is in our midst and that he prays uh, through us and on our behalf today. And God, I, I pray for those who have gallbladder issues this morning, Lord, uh, as I saw several people uh, who experienced discomfort and, and pain from this. Um, God, I know you don't waste any experience uh, in our life. And uh, I pray, God, that you would uh, bring healing and comfort and strength uh, to those who, who struggle uh, with pain from this illness. And Lord, if we pray for peace in our world, protection, supernatural protection and aid for those in Ukraine who are fighting for the freedom of, of their nation. And God, we, we just lift up to you our earth right now. Uh, we know, Lord, that it is in your hands and it's only as we trust it's in your hands that we can sleep at night with peace in our hearts. We pray all of these things and we lift them up to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you join us uh, this morning by way of computer, we want to remind you as we take up our offering today uh, that you can go to our church website page. There's a tab that you can click on. Uh, just click on that tab, follow a few simple instructions. And uh, you can make a gift to our church. And we just want to say thank you for supporting our ministry here. Uh, we can never give out God our faith. We can never get out give our faithful God. And we give to him not out of duty, but out of joy and delight, acknowledging the good things that he does for us.
If you would join with me uh, as we pray, this is my part. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we praise you for raising our Son, your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ from the dead. With joy, we witness the miracles that you continue to perform even during our day through the power of your Holy Spirit. Use our ties and gifts in miraculous ways for Jesus' sake. Amen. And let us remain standing. Uh, we'll join together in the hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. And I'll remind you, she plays through this once. She plays through the verse once. that half a verse. <laughs> All right. See, this is encouragement for the choir. You guys will, you will never mess up worse than we do without caring. Thank you. you may be seated. And also, this is the Lord saying, if you got any kind of gifts or talent for music, <laughs> you play a guitar, you can hold a tune, sing in a bucket, you can, we were glad to have you. All right. We're going to continue as we go into our Easter season. Um, this is our appearance number three of Easter. Uh, of course, we know after the resurrection, Jesus remained on earth for 40 days, and he uh, appeared several times during that 40 days. A lot of time he spent instructing his disciples. And this particular account we're going to read this morning uh, takes place on the second Sunday of Easter. Jesus had appeared to Mary and the women on resurrection morning. He appears to the disciples without Thomas in the evening time while they were hiding behind locked doors. And this time, he appears to his disciples when they're back home fishing. They leave Jerusalem. They go back home to go fishing. And if you're going to record anything, this passage very much mirrors Luke chapter 5. And Luke chapter 5 is the recording when Jesus first met the disciples and the first time he called them, they were fishing. And a very similar miracle happens there as happens here. So I believe this is another call story. At the first call, they were fishing. They have a miraculous catch. 
I think in this text, we find the disciples depressed, discouraged. I think they've kind of maybe given up a little bit. And uh, we know Peter was especially discouraged. And uh, the disciples go back home, and I, I think they're really, they're really debating on giving it up. And uh, the Lord comes and he gives them a whole nother call story, takes them right back to the very first time he called them. Uh, so if you, if you have time to read those scriptures and compare, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, comparison there. So I'm going to read for us from John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And, of course, that's Lake Galilee. Tiberias is another name for Lake Galilee. And this is how he showed himself. Simon Peter. And there's seven who are named here, we're told of here. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, the two sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. So they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any food? They answered and said to him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John speaking of himself, the disciple John said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about a football field length from land. And they were dragging the net with fish with them. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it. The last time Peter denied Jesus, there was fire, remember? They saw a fire of coals and fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've caught. Simon Peter went up and he dragged that net to land full of large fish, 153. He'd be a strong guy to do this by himself. And although there, there were so many fish, the net wasn't broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then came and tucked the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because Jesus said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then Jesus here gives a prediction to Peter regarding how he would die. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you walked wherever you wished, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not wish. This Jesus spoke signifying by the type of death, Peter would bring glory to God. And when Jesus had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that you would 
speak to us your truth this morning. We pray, Lord, that in some way that you would open up the eyes of our hearts, enable us to see you from them, and to know that you are here. We pray that you would feed us that bread that only you can give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we come to the text today. You remember Jesus was crucified outside of uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem was 70 or 80 miles from Galilee. So sometime between the resurrection of Jesus and this fishing scene, the, dis the disciples went back home, 70, 80 miles. They went back home. They probably had family to care for, business to take care of. So they go back to the Sea of Galilee. And apparently they get back there to the same nets, the same water, and they decide to do the same kind of work that they were previously doing when Jesus first called them. Jesus first called them, they were fishing, and he said to them, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men instead of uh, fishers of fish in the water. Also, they went back to Galilee because <clears throat> the, the angel had told them to go ahead to Galilee in Matthew 28 and said that you're going to be instructed there. And as I was saying, I believe at this point the disciples were still downhearted. They were discouraged. They were probably on the verge of maybe being ready to quit. Uh, all throughout the gospel, whenever Jesus talked about suffering and giving his life, uh, the disciple writers make clear to us, uh, the, the gospel writers make clear to us that the disciples didn't understand it. They always said, you're not going to die like this. Peter said that to Jesus. They, always, they didn't seem to quite get it. They didn't think that there was any way that God would let Jesus die. I really believe that. And when he did die, and the type of death he died, I think really made the words he spoke to them about if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up a cross, deny yourself. I think those words took on new meaning for them. And I think they were all really wrestling in their minds with what had happened. I mean, they had seen Jesus crucified in a very, uh, very brutal way. They had all failed Jesus. We often emphasize Peter, but they all failed Jesus. They abandoned him when he was arrested. Uh, all of them basically denied knowing him. And uh, Thomas had his doubts, Peter with his denials. And the Lord knew that it was a difficult time for them. But thank God for his grace that when we go through a difficult time and we're struggling with our faith, and maybe we, we don't feel like we've necessarily done the things we should have been doing lately or made a mistake. Thank God that his grace is greater than our sin. And God and Jesus, I believe, taught this lesson to the disciples. They needed to know this, that the grace of God would be greater than their sin. The grace of God is greater than our mistakes. So it's, it, we, we should never reach a place even if we end up like the prodigal son out in the pig pen, as far away from God as we can be, there is no place where, that Jesus says the Father won't be standing waiting for us to turn and just to make that approach back to him, to never give up. And I think that Jesus used this experience to do that. And I, I also think that this experience teaches us that the Lord comes to us in the regular day, everyday events of life. They weren't in synagogue. They weren't in a temple. They weren't having a prayer meeting. Nothing's wrong with those things. They all have their time and place. But I think so often we, we, we believe wrongly that the Lord only meets us in those places. When in all actuality, this whole earth is his temple. This whole earth is his synagogue. He fills this whole earth. His presence is everywhere. And no matter where we are, even in a jail cell, his presence is there. And if we acknowledge him and call upon him, worship him, we can do so with faith, knowing that he's there. 
And through scripture, we see that he's a God who, who shows up, especially, uh, especially when we fail. He's a God who shows up and gives grace to us. I think at this time, the disciples went back out, partly thinking, if we have a good fishing night, we're going back to fishing. You know, I think they, they went back out and said, we'll give this another try. And if we have a good night, this is going to be our sign. We're going back to fishing business, to what we know. And, of course, they had, a bad, they had a bad night, and they were trusting in their own plans. They had come up with their own plans. They were trusted in their own strength, you know, getting all the stuff together. But as I mentioned before, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And oftentimes, especially in our time in which we live today, and I'm not saying not to think things through or not to use your brain, but I, but I am saying that oftentimes what we think we know gets in the way of God. Sometimes God calls us to do things or leads us a direction that logic is never going to be able to, to jump that leap. It's never going to take that leap. But if you know that the Lord has called you, you have to take that leap relying on him knowing that he can make it work, whatever it is. And I think really that's the, that's the call of the church, not to copy what some other church has done or copy some uh, plan that a church has used and it got large and therefore we're going to teach your church how to do the same thing and you're going to do what they did. No, that was God's plan for them, might not necessarily be his plan for us. And I think that God has a plan for all size churches. Amen. Matter of fact, I, I, I feel like sometimes people in our church get down on ourselves because we're not large, whatever, how, however you define that. But 80% of churches are worshiping between 70 and 200 people. So that's the average. You're, you're not a small church. So I think you just need to take that mindset and just throw it out the window. Don't let that cross your mind when you're thinking about our future. But instead, think about this. Without him, we do nothing. They fished all night without Jesus. They were probably thinking about leaving him. Without him, they could do nothing. But then on the other hand, Jesus shows up. He shows up and... And even when he shows up, they had to have some faith because they couldn't quite make out that if it was him or not. But they believed it was him, so they took the step of faith to obey what he had to say to do. And, of course, he told them, cast your net on the other side of the boat. When the Lord first called the disciples, he told Peter that same thing, and Peter's response to him was, Lord, we fished all night, we caught nothing. But at your word... We'll do, we'll do what you've said. And I'm sure the disciples had fished all night. They'd caught nothing. They were discouraged. These were professional fishermen. But they believed they had had a word from the Lord. And they obeyed and, and they did what he had told them. And because they were abiding in him, you know, they were fruitful. John 15, our Lord tells us, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. He says, if you abide in me, there's going to be joy in your life. There's going to be fruit in your life. And, and that's the key to success. Not, not necessarily relying on man's education, even though there's nothing wrong with education, not necessarily relying on our logic, there's nothing wrong with that, but there comes a time in faith, again, where you have to walk on the word of Jesus. You have to trust the word of Jesus. And success is in our Lord's hand, and he tells us how to get it. He tells us, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things shall be added unto you. You know, if you're living your life every day and you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
you can have peace that you're pretty much where the Lord has you to be. Maybe you're not quite doing everything he has for you to do, but if you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you're definitely in the right direction there. So Jesus shows up, and he turns things around. He turned it around. There was a me- they, they had a mess. They turned things, but Jesus turned things around. You know, life gets pretty messy at times, especially when we make mistakes. But Jesus is able to turn things around. And then when he turns things around, he, he comes to Peter and he teaches us a lesson through this lesson that he teaches Peter. One time in pride, Peter said to Jesus, even if they all forsake you, Lord, I won't. And he says, matter of fact, even if they all run off and leave you and I have to die with you, I will. So the Lord calls that back to his mind in this conversation. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And he's talking, do you love me more than the other disciples? And in humility, he doesn't say, I love you more than they. He says, Lord, you know I care about you. He doesn't say, I care about you more than they do. And he doesn't say, I care about you enough to sacrifice myself for you. Because that's the word of love that's used, sacrifice. For God so loved, he sacrificed his son. Agape is the word that's used there. But Peter says, I phileo, I love you like a friend. I care for you greatly. And then he asks Peter a second time, do you love me? And he uses that same sacrificial love type of word. And Peter says to him, Lord, I love you like a friend, like my best friend. He doesn't doesn't put his foot in his mouth this time. So a third time, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me like a friend? And at that, the scripture says Peter was kind of hurt that he asked him that third time. And Peter says, said to him, you, Lord, you know all things. You know my heart. The first time that Peter had said some things, he was self-deceived. He was deceived in his own heart. He thought he was able to do more, more than he was actually able to do. But the Lord, uh, through this experience, uh, revealed uh, to Peter that he could only give to God what God gave to him. We can only give God sacrificial love if God gives to us that type of love in us. We can't give out to people, we can't give out to others what we don't have ourselves. That's why our doing for God has to come from being with God. We could do a lot of things in the church for God, but if we haven't been with God, then people won't experience God through the work that we're doing. So you want to, again, seek ye first, be with God, and allow whatever you do each day for God to flow out of that. Peter, Jesus said to Peter these two things, these things, I want to point them out to you. He says, feed the lambs, feed the sheep. Lambs are the little ones. Sheep are the big ones. You know, this is the, uh, another version of the Great Commission. And uh, he says, you're to feed them uh, by going out and preaching the gospel. Not our political views or our social views or necessarily our opinions on every matter but preaching the gospel that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if we're going to be true to the Great Commission as the church, we have to be obedient to that call. We can give away half the world and not make disciples. We have to give the gospel first and foremost before we give out anything else. Because ultimately, if we're not pointing others to Jesus, we're, we're allowing them to walk away having missed the greatest thing we can give them. Jesus is greater than the meal 
He's greater than the cake. He's greater than any other physical thing we can give them. Therefore, we have to make sure that sharing the gospel is a part, first and foremost, of the things we do on his behalf. Jesus said, first, go and make disciples, baptize, then teach them all the things I've told you. Teach them. Hundred and fifty three fish. They counted those fish. There's all kinds of opinions on what that hundred and fifty three number meant. I came across one that I think holds a little bit of water. At that time, the Greeks thought there were 153 different kind of species of fish in the sea. So when they caught that net, when they got that net and they pulled it in, they saw all those different species. It was a physical picture of them going out and making disciples of all nations, from every tribe, every tongue, every race. So here in this part of the Great Commission, Jesus says, feed the Feed the lambs, the little ones, feed the sheep. Uh, go out, take the gospel to, to everyone. Make disciples. Don't leave anyone behind. And you know, the gospel message is a message that the world still needs. It needs it. Even if it don't want it, it needs it. We have a message the world needs, and it's not a Baptist message or a Catholic message or Pentecostal message but it's the message of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the Son of God, for our sin. And when the church presents that message, no matter where it's presented, it will result in changed lives. And hopefully it's resulted in yours and mine, first and foremost. I have faith in that message. I know what it's done for me. I know what it continues to do for me. And hopefully you have faith in that message. You know what the gospel's done for you. And all the Lord asks of us is to share that message with others. Don't try to give what you don't have. Give what the Lord has already given you. Let us pray. Holy God, it's easy for us to get caught up in trying to do your work in our own minds, our own ways. And not seek your guidance the way that we should. We pray, God, that you would help us to seek your face first. Help us to seek to know you first in all things so that we can walk in your way, so that we can know you're, you're directing our paths, so that we can hear your still, small voice. And we just thankful, Lord, that you're God who turns things around you took an empty boat in an empty net, and you filled it full. And God, today we bring our emptiness to you. We bring empty hearts to you. We bring what we sometimes feel is empty life to you. Not much to, to give or offer you or anyone else. We offer our, our church to you. It's your boat. It's your net. We pray, God, that you would take and use it to fill it with fish, additional fish besides us, for your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God he's caught us in the net so far and we're a part of that kingdom <clears throat> on the night that our Lord would give himself up for us of course we remember that he took bread and he broke it and I invite you to take your wafer out if you're able to And you can go ahead and break it and look at it and hear these words of Jesus as you do, as he speaks to us. He says to us, 
This is my body, which is broken and given for you. Take and eat. And as we eat his body, you can go ahead and take and eat your wafer. As we eat his body, we become his body. We partake of him and we become more and more of him. And after they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks to the Father. He said to his disciples, take a drink from this cup, each one of you, for it is the blood of the new covenant. For, the, for, you, for your forgiveness, he said to the disciples, and also for the forgiveness of many. Scripture tells us as often we do this, we remember our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And of course, his promise to come again. The blood of Christ that was poured out for you, take and drink. If you would, would you stand and lead us in prayer? We, we could pray this together. Living Lord, you meet us in unexpected places and surprise us with the abundance of your love. Feed us by your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. And let's remain standing and join together in our closing hymn. I know we all know this. Jesus, keep me near the cross. And of course, she, play, she plays through one whole verse. Uh, I come from places where we just play through the, the chorus and then we start, but she plays through the first verse. So the second time it comes through, let's try to take the plane off together.
Amen. Higher powers here. <laughs> God, we thank you for the gift of joy. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you, you have a sense of humor. That you're able to bring joy uh, to our hearts and uh, no, every time and no matter what the place. And especially we thank you for giving us joy here in your house. Now may the love of God our Father, the peace of Jesus Christ, our loving Lord and Savior, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit go with you now and be with you forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone. <laughs>